couple of you to okay um to symposium number seven. Oh my god i see myself in a very large view okay this is better um symposium number seven that will be all about dyslexia and reading difficulties my name is C.P. Horowitz Krauss. I'm the chair of the session, and I have the beautiful lineup of speakers today Professor Tali Bitan from uh, uh, Haifa University, Professor Nama Friedman from Tel Aviv University, and Professor Mirav Hakisar from the Hebrew University. I have to say personally that I was waiting for so long to have this symposium because these researchers are one of the only researchers that are actually using um, um, neuroimaging tools uh, to work with, <laughs> sorry about my voice, uh, both children and adults um, in uh, neuroimaging facilities, uh, and especially focusing on reading difficulties. We really wanted to have this meeting face-to-face, -face, but unfortunately, we will take what we have. So I'm really happy to have you all with us today. Um, the title of this symposium is uh, Researching Dyslexia from Multiple Linguistic and Non-Linguistic Perspectives, Neurobiological and Neuropsychological Evidence. Uh, we have 18 minutes for each talk. You are more than welcome to post questions uh, in the chat. And I will pick only one question after each of the uh, sessions. I'm sorry, we have two minutes per, uh, per uh uh, question, and um, then we will move on to the next talk. At the end, we will have some time for discussion. So, uh, having said that, I will start with the first speaker, Professor Tali Bitan, who will talk about uh, learning and processing morphological regu uh, regulatories in adults with developmental dyslexia. Tali, Thank the you. stage is yours. Thank you, TP. Can you all see my screen? And my mouse moving around. Great, thank you. So one of the questions that is um, moving around in the literature is whether there is a morphological deficit in dyslexia. And we stand on both sides of this debate. And this is why I'm interested in it and wanted to uh, share it with you today. And maybe you can help me think about the reasons for why we see this discrepancy within our studies. So I will present two studies, one showing uh, or testing the effect of sleep on consolidation of novel morphological inflections, where we see, we do see impairment in uh, dyslexic readers in the extraction of morphological regularity, regularities. Uh, the other one is an fMRI study where we tested uh, uh, participants reading a Hebrew derived, morphologically derived words, and over there, we see not only there is no impairment, but even enhanced uh, morphological segmentation or morphological processing. Um, so this is the discrepancy I'm talking about. So in the first study, uh, impaired extraction of morphological regularities during learning and consolidation in developmental dyslexia, a domain general deficit, question mark. Um, was done by Daphna Benzion, my uh, PhD uh, student in collaboration with uh, Anat Puyo, uh, her co-supervisor. Co um, and in this study, we wanted to test this hypothesis that, well, there is this uh, section in the literature suggesting that there is morphological impairment in dyslexia. So our, uh, we wanted to test the hypothesis that this is a deficit in learning and consolidation specifically. Um, if so, perhaps this could be explained by suggestions of a sleep impairment that is disrupting consolidation. And, and if this is true, this might be a domain general deficit as other labs have suggested for uh, dyslexia. So to test this, we used our favorite mini language, artificial language that we use in uh, we've already used in a few studies in our lab. In this mini language, participants learn to make morphological inflections uh, using three suffixes. So there are uh, new words that they learn, uh, and there is a morphophonological regularity embedded within these words. So singular forms ending with oz uh, are inflected using the suffix an, singular forms ending with odd are inflected with esh, 
And there are also some exceptions to make this mini language more naturalistic and make the irregularity less obvious or so they can learn it implicitly. Um, previous studies in our lab have shown that this mini language or learning these inflections activate a network of frontal areas, very typical of uh, inflections in the natural language. Uh, and this is true, especially when participants are uh, generalizing these irregularities to new words. So, and much more than when they are inflecting uh, the trained words that they've already, were already familiar with. Um, we also see that learning this language uh, activates the basal ganglia, which is a set of regions that is associated with skill learning or procedural learning very early on in the learning process. So in the current study, we had four groups of participants, two groups of typical adult readers and two groups of uh, dyslexic readers with a phonological deficit. Uh, importantly, they had no ADHD. Um, of these, the first two groups were trained in a sleep first condition. So they were trained in the evening and then they were tested 12 hours and 24 hours in the following morning and then evening again. The other two groups, the wake first groups, were trained in the morning and then tested in the evening and in the morning. So the first interval uh, contained sleep for the first two groups and was uh, full of uh, wake in the other two groups. In addition to learning the linguistic task, they were also trained on a motor sequence learning task that is an adaptation of Avi Carney's uh, motor sequence learning finger sequence learning. But this was done in, these were the same participants, but in a separate set of sessions. So it was uh, the same structure, but separate sessions. So what do our results show? For the trained items, we see that dyslexic readers uh, learn much less or less than uh, typical readers. However, uh, this difference was not significant, but as we go along 12 hours and 24 hours after training, the gap becomes wider. And during consolidation, the difference between dyslexic and non and typical readers is significant. If we break these into separate groups, the sleep first and the wake first groups, we see that for typical readers, we see a significant effect of sleep. So there is a great difference if uh, people are sleeping during the first 12 hours or they are awake. However, in the dyslexic group, we see somewhat similar pattern, but this is not significant within dyslexia. So we think that there might be something there, although uh, there is no significant interaction, so we cannot be sure. So we think that there are some uh, weaker effects of uh, sleep in dyslexia. What happens with the generalization, which is the, the main a test where that can show us learning of generalization. So we see that dyslexic readers are much uh, uh, poorer or they do not extract the morphological regularities. They perform a chance level almost during all the tests. And we also see that they uh, use non-existing suffixes. So they didn't even learn the set of relevant suffixes for using the, the uh, inflections. So definitely they did not extract the morphological regularities. What happens in the motor task? So in absolute terms, the dyslexic readers perform much slower. However, there is no difference in the amount of online learning or offline consolidation when comparing them to the uh, typical readers. Interestingly, when we look at the generalization to the, an untrained hand, dyslexic readers do not generalize. So there is higher hand specificity in the dyslexic readers. So uh, if we think of generalization to the untrained hand as an indication of abstraction of the, making it more abstract, the, the representation, so they show a uh, a deficit in making this representation of the sequence uh, abstract. 
So to summarize the results of this study, we see the dyslexic readers are impaired in extracting both linguistic regularities and also in creating abstract representations of a motor sequence. So this type of this aspect of the deficit seems to be domain general. Uh, they had a particular def uh, impairment in the consolidation part. And this is perhaps due to weaker effects of uh, sleep, although this part was not significant. And this was not domain general. So we, don't, we didn't find the same things for the motor task. To move on quickly to the second study, here we are going back to uh, reading. Uh, previous one was spoken language. So now we are back to reading and we're looking at existing Hebrew words for uh, uh, participants are familiar with uh, in the scanner. So to look at their brain activation. This study was based or one of the goals of this study was to test an assumption for a general assumption, not just for dyslexic readers, for skilled readers, that morphological segmentation helps compensate for the lack of transparency in a non an unpointed, so the words without diacritics in general in the, in the orthography. So one of our questions uh, for skilled readers was, do they really rely on morphological segmentation more when they are reading unpointed words? So the opaque, trans the non-transparent orthography. Regarding dyslexic readers, so we had two conflicting hypotheses. If indeed uh, morph uh, dyslexic readers are impaired in morphology whatsoever, then we would expect to see weaker or no effects of morphology in the brain when they are reading morphologically uh, structured words. However, there is also a literature suggesting that morphology helps participant or dyslexic readers compensate for their phonological deficits. And if this was the case, we do expect to, to find morphological effects in the brain and find it even more in the transparent, in the pointed words, where participants are expected to rely more on phonological decoding. So going, these were our predictions or questions going into the study. Here we used existing Hebrew words, which participants just had to read them aloud in the scanner. And we used two types of words. We used a regular bimorphemics, so a root and template words in Hebrew, and compared them to monomorphemic words that do not contain a productive root. So they're, they're, they don't have roots that we use in, in uh, verbs. Uh, word sets were matched on number of letters, consonants, syllables, and frequency. Uh, we had two type, two sets of one, one uh, study was uh, behavioral, so it was outside the scanner, we had uh, more participants, and then it, uh, the fMRI study was identical. Behaviorally, we found that typical readers read fast, not showing no effects whatsoever, but dyslexic readers are impaired by diacritics, so they read slow, more slowly when they have the pointed words. However, the morphological structure um, makes it easier for them. So they read faster when the words are contain a root and template. Uh, and this is regardless of diacritics. So based on behavior, we wouldn't suspect there was any effect of diacritics. Diacritics are making it harder, but uh, morphology affects nonetheless, there is no interaction. In the brain, however, I will skip this in the sake of time. When we look at frontal areas, the same frontal areas that I mentioned that are involved in morphophonological decomposition, um, maybe late in the process of pro processing a word, we see that both groups, uh, typical readers and dyslexic readers, show morphological effect in these uh, frontal areas, but only for unpointed words. So all these regions only show the morphological effect in unpointed words, suggesting that this may be indeed a compensatory strategy for the lack of transparency in unpointed words. So from this, we would think, okay, dyslexic readers read morphology to the same extent or no less than typical readers. However, looking at the visual word form area, 
which is an occipital temporal area that is involved in uh, processing orthography, here we see uh, an additional effect in uh, dyslexic readers. And here it is uh, only uh, shown. 35 minutes. Thanks. Sorry. Here it is only shown in pointed words. Previously, we saw, saw this only in unpointed words. So here we see only in pointed words and only in dyslexic readers. So this might be a compensatory strategy. They're applying uh, or doing some morphological segmentation already when processing the orthography of the word. So to summarize the second study, skilled and dyslexic readers uh, of Hebrew uh, rely on morphophonological decomposition when reading unpointed words. And this might be a way to compensate for the opacity, for the lack of uh, vowel information in the script. However, dyslexic readers also rely on morpho-orthographic decomposition, if there is such a thing, uh, when reading pointed words, which are a bit harder for them to read. And this may be a compensatory strategy for their decoding, phonological decoding deficits. Since it looks like I have a little bit more time, I will just mention that the same participants, we also did the structural imaging with them and in collaboration with Michal ben Shachal's group, uh, Maya Yablonski found that uh, morphological awareness and phonological awareness in this same subject was uh, associated with different pathways in the brain. So not going further into it, but separate uh, predictions for morphological and phonological uh, related to the question of whether the morphological uh, processing is separate or the same as. So to conclude overall, dyslexic readers with phonological deficits are impaired in extracting statistical regularities and in creating abstract representations. And this is found across domains. They're also impaired specifically in consolidation uh, and show less benefit of sleep compared to uh, typical readers. But this aspect, we didn't find that it is domain general. Maybe it is a matter of a task, maybe in a different study, something else will be found. However, and here is the contrast, in life, after lifelong exposure to, morphologic, to the morphological structure of Hebrew words, which they are familiar with, they are sensitive. They are uh, becoming sensitive to the morphological structure and they are using it and they're even using it more than typical readers to compensate for their deficits in phonological decoding. Uh, the way they compensate is somehow related to the orthographic structure of the of the words. And thank you very much. Thank you, thank Tali. You, Tali. And, and thank you so much for being so precise on time. Um, I do not see questions right now in the chat, but I do want to allow any questions if anybody in the audience have one. Uh, I see that Esti has a question. Um, she, Esti. Yes, thank you. Um, I uh, thank you, Tali, for the very clear talk. Uh, I'm from home, and unfortunately, my computer fell just as you showed the results of the finger sequence task. Uh, <laughs> however, I understand from your summary that uh, there were no consolidation deficits on this task, right? For the motor, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, right. The, the motor, they showed the uh, overall, this is the motor. Overall, a slower performance, but no deficit in learning or consolidation. Okay so, okay, so we have just published the paper on second graders who are at risk for dyslexia. Uh, they were, were uh, and we, we, they, we, we had four groups. We looked at dyslexia and on mother education at second graders. But overall, we had an overall deficit in production of the, of the graphomotor test, but there was also a consolidation deficit for second graders. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It may be somewhat related to the low. I, I, no, I don't think so. It was, there was some deficit, um, maybe because our task is more related to reading because of the, you know, how the task is structured. Uh, so we did have a small deficit for dyslexic, dyslexic uh, second graders. You must have adults here. Uh, 
Yes, we're talking about adults. I think uh, this is really interesting what you're saying because we do found, uh, we did find this, the, the increased hand specificity, so less abstraction. And I do think consolidation is related to processes of abstraction. So making the representation more abstract is, is related to yeah. Uh, consolidation. Yeah, we also so, had generalization deficit. Yes, we also tested generalization and there was also a deficit there. Um, I can send you the paper. It's uh, Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. You will. Thank you for the talk. Thank you so much, Esti, for the question and Tali for the wonderful talk. And again, uh, talking about um, the, the hand specificity brings some questions uh, in my head regarding uh, the corpus callosum and how efficient the information transfers also between hemispheres. Um, there are some studies like that as well, uh, looking at, at uh, individuals with dyslexia and at risk for dyslexia. But for the sake of time, I will move on really quickly to the next speaker, uh, Professor Mirab Chisar from the Hebrew University, who will talk about reduced learning of sound categories and dyslexia is associated with a fast uh, decaying anchor. Right. Uh, yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes. So it means that you can also hear me, and that's wonderful. Uh, so a good morning, and thanks, Tali, for your talk. Uh, as, as a very, very brief introduction to my talk, the way um, I come to the study of dyslexia, not from reading research or from language research, but from uh, perception and perceptual learning research. And in particular, uh, sorry, uh, studying skill acquisition. And we are looking for general framework within which we can understand skill acquisition. And within this very broad framework, reading is yet another example. So in a broader uh, uh, sense, what makes an expert an expert is the um, ability to use very, very intensive and massive uh, training, which of course applies to reading task specific training, which allows using the tasks, specialties and uh, the statistics that we use for the task in order to switch the way that the task is performed, typically from serial performance to more um, uh, parallel performance. And in order to assess the learning process, we use some linguistic parts, but in today's talk, I'd like to focus on our studies of our favorite task, which is two-tone frequency discrimination. This is the task. I hope you can hear me because I shared sound. These are like, wow, in my ears, not in everybody's ears. I love these sounds. And what the participant is asked to do is which tone has a higher pitch? Few participants have difficulties in the concept and tend to confuse it with intensity. But basically, this is a, a question one can ask for pe from people ages six and above, something like this in a relatively reliable manner. The other aspect which is really nice in this task is that stimuli are very simple. And as such, oddly enough, they were hardly experienced in daily life. So in a way, we come to participants without very much experience within the sounds that we are presenting and we can track their uh, gradual learning of the, uh, in a way, sound bank or patterns or regularities that we are administering to them. For example, within this framework, morphology is one kind of structural regularity. Where you have a fixed, the parallel will be a fixed pitch, a fixed sound, and then followed by something which is broader. And the question in this uh, concept we'd ask is whether participants with um, dyslexia have a difficulty in acquiring structural regularities. And the answer is yes. But I will, uh, um, in this task, in this talk, sorry, focus on our attempt to decipher neural mechanisms underlying the processes of learning. So just to uh, uh, start from our beginning with this task, the uh, first time we studied it systematically, we asked this, we assessed the same task under two conditions. So this is one group, and these are the thresholds that were measured in two different conditions. In one condition, uh, the tones that we present in each tribe are randomly selected and we uh, measure what should be the minimal difference for people to attain. These are teenagers for people to attain 80% uh, correct. And this is a very large uh, frequency difference between the, the two tones. Whereas if in each tribe you have a given sound that is repeated, 
a repeated reference. These are very, very robust results. People have substantially lower thresholds, namely they utilize this simple regularity of reference repeated across trials. Typically, they're unaware of this regularity. They're not trying to remember this, but we have this memory trace which automatically improves performance even though we are not aware of it. And to our, at that point, utter amazement, people with uh, dyslexia had no general difficulty in doing the task under difficult conditions. However, they did not, in this case, they did not at all. Typically they, they benefit, but to some extent, small, to a smaller uh, level, sorry, compared with controls, but typically they gain less from this regularity. And what I'd like to do uh, in the remaining time is to uh, tell you a bit more about our gradual understanding of the neural processes underlying this gradual regularity. So just to put it in a broader framework within a sort of brain related uh, uh, conceptualization, what we think of as the general process of acquiring expertise is that people start with frontal processing across tasks. This is not specific to reading, even though the specific regions are, are different. They do it uh, serially, they do the task serially, they do it utilizing uh, dorsal frontal parietal regions. However, when you're experienced, the more experienced we are with the task and with the material, you use gradually more ventral streams like the case of the uh, visual word form area and the more experienced you are, you can do that. But in order to do that effectively, you need, you need to integrate the regularities that you're experiencing. This regularity integration is typically largely non-explicit, but you have to detect these regularities for reading to become uh, in a way more parallel and more based on ventral streams. And what I'd like to show is our attempt to understand what is the difficulties that this, what is the source of difficulties that dyslexics have with integrating regularities. So let me just show you one example of how we can introduce beyond just having a reference, very clear regularities and show you that when there are regularities, the nature of the task that participants are performing without being aware of it is really substantially changed. So this is a case where this is one, uh, one step, one um, trial, one, two, three, four. And in every trial, the first tone is always the same. So it's not just a repeated reference. The position of the reference in the trial is always first, okay? So even though participants cannot tell that there was a repeated reference, the thresholds are lower and they actually learn to access only or to, to listen or to judge only the second one. So they form a reference, but in a way they learn to perform this task by categorization rather than by comparison. How can we tell that? So this is the other condition that we administered. It's the same task, same form of repetition, but the repeated reference is always second, okay? So what's the difference? Well, people learn to do it very well in both conditions. However, when the reference is actually repeated in the second uh, um, sound, people unaware of that actually make categorization before the second tone is presented, okay? Not in the first, uh, not in the first step because they, it's, it's just the same, but after three, four steps, they start to make the judgment even before the second tone was presented. If we just look at their response time, they always respond after the second, or almost always after the second. If we ask them what they do in both, in both uh, types, they tell us they, what they do is listen to the first, listen to the second, make a decision and compare, etc. But then we look at the ERP responses. Why are ERP responses informative in this case? So this is, this is just an example of one informative electrode, CZ, just at the top of the head. And this is what we get with the first tone and second tone. And these are the main components. So N1, NP2 to the first tone and to the second tone are uh, produced by the auditory cortex, grander auditory cortex. It's not just primary, it's about 100 milliseconds. This is why it's called N1, 200 milliseconds. But then the informative part for us in this case is what's called P3. P3 is a component that had been heavily studied and it's in a way a decision component. When you understand how to categorize, how to answer the task, you have a P3 response. By the way, if you do the task, but you're a chance level performance, 
you don't have a P3, okay? You need to have a perceptual clarity of what it is that you're about to do. And here's the important part. This is what we find when the first tone is always fixed. So we have a response to the first, a response to the second, and then there's the P3. The interesting part is what happens when there's always a reference second, okay? And we are asking, where is the P3? When was the decision made? After the second tone, as people would say, or after the first tone, because the information is already there, given that you utilize the context, okay? And this is what we find. The P3 component was shifted to after the first tone. In a way, implicitly, people make categorization decision about which tone is higher even before the second tone was actually presented, which we take as a, uh, uh, as a proof for people learning to make implicit categorization when there is a detected regularity, because this is identified what's the category of this sound is either higher, which is high, higher than the repeated reference or low, but you can do it if you are sensitive already after the first tone. Our claim is that this type of categorization is impaired in dyslexia because they are not sensitive to regularities. Can we look at it? And if this is the case, is it really something that one sees already at the level of the auditory cortex? And for that, Ayelet, whose paper has just been actually published yesterday, uh, uh, has studied the same question in uh, fMRI because then we could specifically tell whether we see a difference in the pattern of sensitivity to regularities in the primary auditory cortex uh, of people with dyslexia. So the pattern that she used was, uh, well, I'm never bored with these sounds, but the point is that the pattern she used, she compared irregular, this is the random, again, a series of tones, participants make these decisions, and look at what happened after a block of like 12 of these tones compared with this series of tones when there is a repeated reference at the first position, namely people can make categorization. And what she has looked at is whether there's difference in the pattern of responses in the primary auditory cortex when this part, when this um, um, format is presented versus when this format is presented. Or in other words, is there a regularity specific pattern of adaptation in the primary auditory cortex of people with dyslexia? And maybe there's no such specific adaptation in the primary auditory cortex of people with dyslexia. And what she found was, so this is a difference in thresholds. So this is what, this is a summary of what she found. This is the pattern of overall board response, the signal change over a block of 10 trials. So it's 20 seconds. Basically, there is a general adaptation. Initially, there's a large response, then this response is adapted, etc. But this is the general response. What we also have is the comparison to the specific conditions when we have this reference repeated at the first position and people perform also in the magnet substantially better, dyslexics not as much, substantially better when there is a repeated reference and these are the differences. When we look at the pattern of people with dyslexia when they perform this task, we see a general pattern of adaptation, which is broad and is not very, very specific to the sound used, but there's no difference between the response in the block, the overall pattern of adaptation without a reference and with a reference. And this difference, so this is just to show you just an illustration of where is the auditory cortex. This is the general auditory cortex. Our primary is kind of roughly there, but we see it both in the primary and in uh, uh, neighboring regions. And this is the single subject distribution, both in the right and in the left auditory cortex. The response in the right auditory cortex is somewhat more reliable as suggested already by Robert Dottore that uh, um, right auditory cortex seems to be more sensitive to pitch compared to the left, but it's not a very, very big difference. Uh, if we look at the Five dynamic- Five minutes, Mira. Five minutes. Okay, thanks. If we look at the dynamics of what it happens, like in the first block ever, have more than 10 trials, so we're looking at the dynamics of subsequent blocks, we see a behavioral difference, and we see a difference in the pattern of adaptation, indicating that it's something that evolves at the time window of about somewhere between uh, 
20 minutes, 20, sorry, 20 seconds to 30 seconds. Then we asked, okay, so the less sensitive to regularities, can we nail it to some specific aspect in which they differ in their auditory cortices? And what we did is look at the pattern of adaptation. Why look at the pattern of adaptation? Adaptation is a very likely candidate to be a source of implicit memory because you see adaptation, you see uh, reduced response, and we're talking about adaptation, which is specific to the stimulus, and hence reveals stimulus-specific memory, and it has a time window. We know that roughly this kind of cortical adaptation, uh, this is uh, previous ERP studies, lasts about 10 seconds. And now we ask, is the adaptation in people with uh, dyslexia shorter? So they don't have as well accumulation of the repeated sounds and repeated pattern because there is some earlier decay. To test that, uh, Sagi, uh, Sagi uh, Daxiafe looked both at ERP responses and at the pattern of uh, fMRI using different types of um, presentation of the same type of stimuli. So we have the main uh, trial, pump pump. And the question is, what is the interval between consecutive trials? So we had the block with sh relatively short interval. This is the standard pump pump, one and a half seconds, another pump pump. Then you had a different block, three seconds interval, a different block, six seconds, nine seconds. And the question was, when you look at the response of the first tone, which comes after short or long interval, is the response still adapted or has it gained its maximal magnitude. If it had gained its maximal magnitude, it means that adaptation is passed, okay? So we are looking at how long it takes for the response to fully recover, namely forget that there had been a previous stimulus, okay? Uh, so what Sagi looked at, this is a bit confusing. I have one minute to explain it, I hope I can. The main point is that adaptation is shorter in dyslexia compared to controls. And the way we see it, this is a response to the first tone. We looked at it, the response, the N1, P2, N1, P2. And what we are superimposing is the response after very short interval, it's smaller, it's very adapted, longer interval, longer interval, longer interval. You see it increases by nine seconds, it increases more than in six seconds. So the four blocks with different intervals are superimposed. When we compare the response to the Dyslexia population, we see that it recovers faster, shorter adaptation. It matches the pattern of behavioral effect, which I cannot explain in five seconds. Uh, we see a broad distribution which uh, encompasses auditory cortex of this effect. This of the color denotes the time constants. Time constant differ in a broad way. And this is the last slide. No questions, last slide. It's just to show that we have the same pattern in reading. So you have faster decay of reading, implicit memory. Uh, if you just ask participants to read as fast as possible, when they have a repetition, they read faster. They didn't think about it, but they read faster. But then when the repetition is with a larger interval, there is a larger decay. And this is the benefit with the small interval, the benefit with the larger interval, and the decay is larger in dyslexia in a way that the implicit forgetting of the specific memory trace was larger in dyslexia. And uh, this is the summary. Memory is produced automatically. It is specific perceptual trace. It decays faster in dyslexia. It's associated with poor performance that decays faster. Thank you. <laughs> right on time. Thank you so much, Mirab. Beautiful talk. Um, I would like to allow some questions from the audience. If the and if there are none, then I have a question. <laughs> um, anyone is raising a hand? I don't. I don't see anyone. So I I, I will ask a question, Mirav. Uh, you were mm -hmm. you were talking about the frontal parietal network at the beginning um, of the talk, and I will talk about it later. Oops. So I would like to make. Uh, to ask, and that maybe it will make a nice connections between uh, between the talks. Um, did you have a chance to examine the involvement of the frontal parietal network uh, within um, your auditory task in the in the scanner, the one that you showed um, for for the um, 
familiarity with the when the first tone uh, was um, was the reference or the second tone was the reference? Right. So, so I have two parts. One is that we have an, a paper which I didn't mention by Luba Daikin in 2015 with this task asking comparing the involvement of frontal parietal network when there are no repetitions compared with repetitions. And we can show that when there are no repetitions, it's more involved and it, its involvement decays. This is a general population, not in dyslexia. Uh, it's involvement decays. Uh, Ayala's paper that just came out, we find that the sensitivity to regularity is found in a uh, controls parietal cortex and is not found in dyslexic parietal cortex. So we think that the parietal cortex is involved in accumulation of evidence for the regularity and does it less efficiently in people with dyslexia, perhaps because it inherits uh, in a way noisier information from sensory cortices. But um, so, so this is our interpretation to why it is kind of, yeah, less shifted to um, remains in a way more executive function uh, among people with dyslexia uh, compared with controls who are highly experienced, right? Yes. Thank you so much, makes, uh, to totally makes sense. And uh, we will make a nice connection afterwards at the end of the, of the session between all talks. Thank you, Mira, for this excellent talk. Uh, we will now move, uh, move on to the third talk from Professor Nama Friedman from Tel Aviv University. The title of her talk is From Types of Dyslexia to the Cognitive Model of Reading Morphologically, uh, Morphologically Complex Words and Back. Nama, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here. Who could think that we could have a ACO conference without hummus, but let's hope for next year. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the way we learn from patients, uh, from errors that patients make to the cognitive model of uh, reading. And it's a slightly different uh, look at the same questions that uh, uh, Tali and Merav have been talking about before and that CP is going to talk about later. And I'm going to start with morphological errors. So a lot of people with dyslexia, both acquired dyslexia and uh, uh, developmental dyslexia make morphological errors. Now I'm talking about Hebrew speakers, but uh, it's, uh, it happens in all uh, morphologically complex languages. We see substitutions, omissions, and additions of affixes. So here, those of you who read Hebrew can read it on the right side, and those who read English can read it on the left side. And you can see in orange the, the root, and in uh, turquoise you can see the affixes. And patients read, for example, a word like chashuvim as cheshbonot, keeping the uh, root but changing the affixes. And these morphological errors may involve all kinds of uh, errors in affixes. And it's important to mention that it's not only uh, semantically related errors. So, for example, chashuvim and cheshbonot, uh, important plural and bills, are not, not really uh, semantically related. Uh, and the question is, uh, ah, and sorry, and this might happen even in morphologically complex non words. So these are patients, this is a patient who uh, read divsa as doves. So instead of she divsed, he read it, he is divsing. It's a non word in Hebrew. Or cheleg is chlagim, the plural of cheleg. And uh, letzicha is litchu, so a noun as a, a past plural uh, verb. So uh, we see morphological errors in many uh, cases. Not all dyslexics show morphological errors, but when they do show morphological errors, the question is, where do they come from? Uh, and I'm usually working within this model, the dual root model for reading, which allows me to, uh, to find the locus, the cognitive locus of impairment of different uh, types of dyslexia. Uh, which result from impairments in different uh, points in this uh, model from the autographic visual analysis through uh, the autographic and phonological lexica to the phonological output production. And there is also a grapheme to phoneme conversion route for non words. But when you look at this model, it's, a very, it's, it's very efficient in explaining a lot of uh, dyslexias, but morphology isn't there to be found. So my endeavor today, and in the, actually in the last four years, is to try to incorporate morphology into this model. 
and I've done it based on the analysis of different patients who have different type who, who make morphological errors, but uh, who may, whose uh, performance in different tasks is different. And I'll show I'll show you in a second how it is how it is. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to show you uh, patients who have selective impairments in different parts of this route. And this is a, maybe you, you probably uh, saw it in the first slide, but this is a collaboration with uh, Reut Stark and Aviag Vion uh, in Tel Aviv University and ONO and uh, with Max Coltart from McWhorter University. Uh, so we looked at these individuals with selective impairments and we built a model on the basis of their selective impairments. So I'm going to do a little bit uh, change the order and show you first show you the model and then show you how each of each type of uh, dyslexia or amorphia a deficit in, morpholo in mor uh, morphology uh, finds its place in the model and I'm just going to say that instead of saying morphologically complex words which is really long I'm going to say more com words and Okay, so here is the proposal. The idea, this model, the idea of this model is that we start with orthographic analysis of letter identity and position and binding letters to words. Then we have some uh, stage of uh, buffering, of orthographic buffering, a short term memory. Uh, then we go to an orthographic lexicon that holds the uh, words, the written words that the uh, person uh, knows and the phonological lexicon that holds the, the phonological sounds and then the phonological output buffer that holds all the, the phonemes until production. We have the grapheme to phoneme conversion that converts a, a, gra a grapheme a letter or, or groups of letters into phonemes and we have a semantic uh, lexicon and conceptual system that allows us to also understand written words and the syntactic system of course. And what we suggest is to start adding morphology into this model. So I'm going to start with the bottom with the phonological output buffer because there we already have quite a lot of data with the uh, uh, Dordotanus here and uh, with the Viag Vion and old work by uh, Laurent Cohen and uh, Deleuze showing that actually the phonological output buffer doesn't hold only phonics, it also holds units, phonological units of additional uh, sizes, it holds number words, it holds function words, and it holds whole morphological, morphological affixes. Therefore, patients who have a deficit in the phonological output buffer, they make phonological errors, but they also substitute one, morphologic, one morpheme with another, one number word with another, or one function word with another when they speak. So it's not only in reading, it's every time they produce uh, phonological sequences, they make these kind of errors. So the idea is that we have a phonological affixicon, a mini storage of affixes in this phonological output buffer that holds whole morphological units, like this and, uh, and, and for Hebrew it might be also the uh, templates, the mishkalim, the binyanim, etc. Now when we think about the uh, lexicons, the orthographic and the phonological lexicon, the question is whether we uh, include all the inflections and all the derivation uh, uh, in the lexicon. So taste, tasted, tastes, katav, kotev, kotvim, kotvot, or whether we have a more efficient way to uh, uh, code this, uh, this information. And what we suggest is that for both the orthographic lexicon and the phonological lexicon, we have a method of uh, stars, uh, a stem affix registry. Namely, for each stem or root, we have a list of the uh, uh, affixes with which they can appear. So uh, for English, it will be taste would appear with tasteful and tasteless. And for Hebrew, it will mention the types of the mishkalim and pinyanim, the templates and the verbal, the verbal and nominal templates in which uh, uh, a root can appear. So these stars would mention that katav can appear with a, a mikhtav and machteva, but not with tachteva, for example. Uh, and importantly, these stars are uh, mention only stem specific uh, information. So it doesn't, for verbs, it doesn't say that a verb can appear in the past and the present and the future, because this, this applies to all verbs. 
you don't need lexical information for that. It, it is only idiosyncratic information. In Hebrew, it will be idiosyncratic information for the root. Uh, now, in the autographic input buffer, we have a parallel uh, affixicon, like we have an affixicon for the output, we have an affixicon for the input, where we hold the affixes in their written form. And this is what uh, Tali talked before about morphological decomposition. This is where this magic happens. So the morphological decomposition happens once we know the identity and position of the letters. We have the whole, the buffer holds the, the whole string of, uh, of uh, letters, in ordered letters. And then we can do the morphological decomposition on the basis of the affixes that we know. So uh, morphological decomposition is uh, structural and it's affix based. So in, in English, you know the affixes, the prefixes, the suffixes, and you do the morphological decomposition. In Hebrew, you're also looking for three letters of the root. And this is how morphological decomposition is done in, at this stage of the buffer. So now we have an autographic affixicon input, we have a phonological affixicon output, and we, uh, we add a morphological converter. So this is a sublexical root that takes the written affixes and converts them to, a phono to phonological affixes. So just like we take a phoneme and convert it to a, graph a grapheme and convert it to a phoneme, we take a grapheme affix and we uh, convert it to a phonological affix. And that's it. That's the model. We also have uh, uh, things about semantics, with, which I don't have time to go into now. But the idea about this uh, morphological conversion uh, is that we uh, impairments, dyslexias, can uh, happen in the autographic affixicon, in the conversion itself, or in the phonological affixicon. And this will look differently for different pe people with dyslexia. Because if they have a deficit in the orthographic of lexicon in the input, they will have deficit morphological deficits in all kinds of input tasks. So they will, all of them will have problems with oral reading of more common words. But people with orthographic of lexicon deficits will have problems also with understanding and lex making lexical decision on morphologically complex words. They will not have problems in production. People with deficit in the conversion will only have problems in oral reading of Morcom words. They will not have problems in comprehension, in lexical decision, in naming, or in repetition. And people with a deficit in the phonological uh, affixicon, output affixicon, will have a problem with oral reading. They will have no problem in comprehension and lexical decision, and they will have a problem in naming and in repetition of orally presented Morcom words. That's the, that's the idea about the morphological conversion root. So what we need to test is not only reading aloud, which would affect all kinds of impairments in the morphological conversion root, but we only also uh, test comprehension from reading without uh, oral production, and we also test production without reading. So then we can tease apart impairments in different parts of this model this model and for this we created a very long list of tests I will just mention them in uh, briefly additional impairments that I will not have time to talk about today but I just want to mention them are impairments in the stars in the autographic lexicon this will also make for example people will not be able to make lexical decision on uh, words like uh, hinshik or computants that are not in the stars impairments in the stars in the phonological output lexicon and this is interesting because we have quite a lot of patients like that who uh, for example if you think about a word like mem bet reish gimel we all read it mavreg but how do we know that it's not mivrag or mevareg we know it because we have the stars in the phonological lexicon that specify that this is the only possible phonological affix for berg so patients who have impairments in here might read mevrag as mevrag without being able to test uh, to check their uh, production with the, with the stars. And finally, of course, we have patients with impairments in some, in the access to semantics from the stars. So I had one patient who I asked to define what uh, she saw the written word mazreka fountain, and she said it's somewhere where you throw which is in a way correct, but what she did was just looking at the, uh, uh, the root zarak, throw, and then trying to, to guess what the meaning is. Now, and, 
things. And we have a syntactic, people with syntactic deficits who uh, also make morphological errors. Okay. So now we can get uh, into the uh, showing you the, the patients themselves and what they were doing. Uh, starting with the orthographic input lexicon, these are uh, three patients. I'm going to focus on one. Uh, she had a Shelley. She had a, a lot of morphological errors in reading. You can see some examples here. Uh, and when we look at her, uh, so in oral reading, but when we look at her comprehension and uh, at her lexical decision, uh, she was very, very impaired because the, the fixicon is part of comprehension as well. In production, however, she was very good. She had no problem in picture naming, no problem in non-word repetition. So her deficit is in the autographic fixicon. Uh, when she had to uh, define words, uh, for example, define a word, the word mazmera, which is this. She's, uh, it's actually a different patient. He said, he, he defined tizmoret. Why? Because it, morphological errors affect, in this stage, affect also their comprehension. Or tovat was defined as tivonit, drowning as vegan. Same root, but complete, completely different uh, meaning. Now I move to a deficit in phonological output buffer. This is Meir. Mayer has very impaired phonological output buffer, uh, which affects his oral reading, his pr uh, production and his repetition, but his comprehension of and lexical decision of Morcom words is completely fine. So he makes morphological errors in production, but uh, only when he's producing things that he's, uh, sorry, he makes morphological errors in uh, production, but not in comprehension, not in input tasks. Susanna has a deficit in the conversion itself. So she makes morphological errors, but only in oral reading. She doesn't have problems in comprehension. She doesn't have problems in lexical decision of more common words. She doesn't have problems in production. So her deficit is only in this conversion between the written form and the phonological form of the affixes. This is another patient, Avri, a patient with a brain tumor who shows a deficit in the conversion. And it's in, I just want to mention him because he makes errors in inflectional, uh, inflectional but, not in, but not in derivational uh, uh, morphology. Why? Because he's impaired only here in the morphological conversion route, but the stars are fine. So the stars allow him to read the derivationally complex words, but he makes a lot of morphological errors uh, in the inflectional morphology. So he would say, uh, so he makes uh, morphological errors in verbs and nouns. Importantly, thanks. Importantly, he also makes errors in function words. So this might mean that the, this morphological conversion root uh, converts not only inflections, but also function words. Okay, now I'm going to the, probably to the last one. Uh, this patient, Ziv, has also has a deficit in the sublexical root, and he, uh, in the morphological root, and he has a problem in reading morphologically complex words and non-words. I want to make a little experiment with you. Try to read these unpointed Hebrew words, okay? You can read them, even though there is no diacritics, you probably read it menashetet, it lanavtem, it bamen, ishtakez, right? But Ziv, unfortunately, has a deficit in the morphological conversion route. He cannot use the morphological conversion route. So he read it men, menstat, hatal, hatal navtam, hatvman, hashtakaz. Okay? So when there is a deficit in the morphological conversion route, Either the patients don't use the morphological conversion route at all, and then you don't see templates or uh, inflections in the reading, or they use it, but then make morphological errors. I'm going to conclude by saying that we found a double dissociation between impairments in the uh, morphological conversion route and in the sublexical route. So patients who have deficit in graphene to phoneme conversion not necessarily have problems in morphological conversion, which means that actually we have two separate sublexical roots. One is for converting the roots, probably, 
converting uh, graphemes to phonemes and the other for converting affixes. I don't have time to go into uh, the lo looks in the brain, but I'm concluding by saying that there are different sources of morphological errors in dyslexia <clears throat> that result from impairments in different components in the uh, cognitive model of reading. And the model can help us understand exactly what the deficit of a patient is and provide the targeted uh, treatment. So maybe I have uh, some answer to the question that Ali asked before. So is there a morphological deficit in dyslexia? Definitely there is a morphological deficit. Some people with dyslexia show morphological uh, deficits and these deficits might be deficits of different kinds. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for the great connections between the talk. We did not plan that. This is, um, this is very spontaneous and beautiful. Uh, we have time for one question from uh, the audience. I think our audience needs some coffee. Uh, Esti, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, great talk, Nama. I, I, I was, um, your connection to the talk by Tari was very impressive. Uh, Tali talked of a specific phonological Ruth, Ruth, and you are speaking of various, um, various phonological or various um, logical. Yeah, morphological mistakes. Sorry, yes. So, is that just a one root, or are these several roots, or what do you think? Or what does Tali think? I don't know. It's I don't know. I think maybe we can take it in the discussion in the end, but I think it completes what uh, Tali suggests. So Tali is looking, for example, I think Tali is finding that you have more morphological uh, uh, processes in unpointed Hebrew is exactly what we what we see. So if Hebrew is unpointed, you have to uh, use the morphological conversion route in order to provide to disambiguate, uh, especially the voweling of the word. So I think it, it completes what uh, what Tali was looking at. Do we have time for Tali's question? Tali, you raise your sure, hand. Sure, Tali, go ahead. Go ahead. We will take some time from the discussion overall. I was just really curious to know what you think, what you, you wanted to say about the brain regions related to... Uh, thank you, Tali. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what we see, uh, we recently, we work with the neurosurgery department in uh, Ichilov. And we work with patients who have a, a glioblastoma and we a, before surgery and during surgery. And what we see is the, that for, for the morph, at least for the morphological conversion and, and the sublexical route, we see some a, consistency in the locus of their a, a, the, the place where the tumor touches the IFOF. And this is mainly in the parietal uh, termination. So uh, you do see some effect of uh, graphene to phoneme conversion and of, uh, and of the morphological conversion somewhere along the IFOF, not the very back part. The very back part is more related to attentional dyslexia, but for this uh, more middle or uh, parietal uh, part that affects, uh, that affects the conversion. Uh, and so I can show you also this patient who had a deficit, this patient with a morphological deficit, you can see that it's quite, uh, it's not very, very uh, far back in the IFOF, it's closer to the, it's in the parietal parts. Interesting. Yeah, so we can compare then the, the DTI that we were showing to, yeah. really interesting. Thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Nama, for this excellent talk. Uh, I had a question myself, but I will keep it to the end um, and allow some individuals to move between sessions. And I think that now it's the time for my talk. I will put a timer for myself, but Nama, please jump in and, uh, and interrupt whenever time's up. Um, and I will share uh, my presentation. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, it, it's a great pleasure and honor to, to chair the session with these beautiful, wonderful speakers. 
uh, that, that talked at the beginning. Uh, my talk will focus on, it's, it's interesting because we really didn't plan it, but uh, focus, we, I will focus on the executive functions component um, within the reading process. Uh, we touched upon these components, which is uh, nice. And I, sh I hope that I will uh, provide some maybe in-depth information about the neural networks that are involved uh, in some of the more basic uh, cognitive abilities involved in reading. These are my disclosures. I want to provide the acknowledgments right at the beginning because sometimes at the end we don't have enough time. Of course, neuroimaging studies and especially uh, in children, uh, it's not a one-man show. It involves so many people that plan, collect, analyze, uh, funding agency, these uh, studies cost a fortune. So these are all my collaborators, my beautiful students, wonderful students that are attending the talk right now. Uh, and I will jump in directly to the take home message because I want you to kind of be tuned on uh, the main aspects um, that I will talk, I will talk about in, in a couple of minutes. So first of all, um, our studies show that executive functions do play a role in reading and reading remediation, both in adults and in children with dyslexia. Uh, this presentation will focus uh, on children, but we have some studies on adults as well. The simple view of reading model, which is one of the traditional models uh, aimed to explain how reading is acquired, um, may also include an involvement of the attention network model that I will talk about in a few minutes. Uh, in the reading process, and that will include or should include both executive functions and more basic attention abilities. And stimulating executive functions may help syncing the systems underlying reading, uh, like the traditional language and visual processing, language auditory uh, and visual processing, and maybe even more. So um, in this talk, I will have short subsections of uh, overall introduction about the simple view of reading and the attention network model. We'll talk a little bit about dyslexia and the characteristics. And then I will jump uh, into talking about training, uh, training reading using an executive functions based reading program in children. Today, unfortunately, I will have time to only show the functional MRI studies, but we worked both on EEG and uh, spectroscopy data and so on. So, Reading uh, is all about translating uh, abstract shapes to sounds in spoken language. Um, very, very challenging, not intuitive ability, although for typical readers, it, it seems like it's very intuitive and automatic. It's really not. Uh, some of the traditional models, neurobiological models that aim to explain which brain regions are involved in this process, uh, focusing on the uh, on the on the language uh, regions, um, angular gyrus, parts in the parietal lobe, the visual cortices, fusiform gyrus, and the regions around it, and semantics, uh, interfrontal gyrus, uh, and this is really the traditional. You see, two thousand and two in neurobiological terms of neurobiolo the neurobiological tools and analysis. This is very anx ancient know now that many networks are involved and we cannot really look at the process with just looking at isolated regions. But this model actually uh, fits nicely uh, into the simple view of reading model. So this model was coined at uh, 1990 by Hoover and Goff. And uh, it explains how reading comprehension is achieved. What it says is that in order to be able to comprehend reading, we need to have intact language processing um, abilities and word decoding abilities. And the word decoding abilities aspect also includes phonological and orthographical processes that Naama talked about uh, in the previous talk. The updated versions of the simple view of reading suggest that um, executive functions, and you see here flexibility and working memory, do have moderating effects uh, in, in the reading process. So flexibility uh, has a moderating effect of language processing and work, working memory on word decoding, and fluency was also suggested to be part of the model because when, you, uh, uh, when you're able to um, 
shift between these, uh, these components and within the components of word reading between orthography and phonology, then fluency reading is achieved and then reading comprehension, um, 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 you can comprehend reading much better. What is unknown, um, as, as you saw, executive functions play a role in the model, but executive functions are only one part of a larger model, model called the Attention Network Model by Peterson and Posen from the 1990s, uh, with some more updates for this model at the early uh, 2000 that, um, um, that, that suggests that the Attention uh, Network Model includes two main components. Uh, one that is more of a bottom bottom up uh, that is also referred to as system one that is related to orienting and alerting attention. And you see here that it involves the ventral attention network and the dorsal attention network in the brain and an executive functions component, which is what I was talking about earlier, that includes um, several processes, some of them are more related to task maintenance and monitoring um, that is more related to the singular percular network. And the other one is related to processes that we talked about earlier, like working memory, speed of processing that are related more to the frontal parietal network. Now, sorry for the busy uh, slide, but it, I wanted to summarize uh, in one slide what we've learned from the involvement of these two systems in the reading process in relation to the simple view of reading. So you don't have to read all these sub uh, uh, studies that uh, we worked on in the past years, but uh, overall, we looked at each of these components, language processing, word decoding, fluency, and reading comprehension in typical readers. And we wanted to see the level of involvement of these systems from the attention network model in reading specifically in each of these domains. And we saw that increased engagement of either a uh, singular percular network or, or processes of it, or the synchrony between these two networks, the, the singular percular and frontal parietal, in language processing, in word decoding, fluency and reading comprehension is increased in typical readers. So the more you can engage these networks, uh, the better your reading is. What is the case in dyslexia, specific reading disability, with several deficits reported from morphological uh, processing uh, to phonological to orthographic? And here we're focusing on the executive functions domain. What we found in dyslexia is that there is a decreased involvement of these networks. Um, and again, we looked at networks, we looked at uh, EEG studies focusing on the ERN, for example, air related negativity that is evoked from the anterior cingulate cortex that is a critical part of the singular percular network. I know that I throw up, I threw, I throw lots of uh, uh, terms here, but. Um, just to uh, briefly explain that we found a reduced involvement, reduced functional connectivity within some of the networks that modulate uh, the, the system one and system two networks, uh, reduced synchronization between um, networks that are involved in executive functions like the frontal parietal network with visual cortices, reduced uh, within network um, connectivity of the singular percular network that is related also to executive functions, a lack of engagement during fluent reading of these two executive functions networks, and again, no difference between sentence, the involvement of um, the executive functions networks uh, for sentences versus words reading, which was found to be increased and engaged in typical readers. And so that led us to the question of, can we change it? So what if we can stimulate these networks while we train reading? Will that improve reading abilities in uh, children with dyslexia while also engaging these, um, uh, these neural networks? So we use the executive functions-based reading training um, um, 
formulated and developed by my late mentor, Professor Tzvia Bresnitz from University of Haifa. Uh, in this, net, in this uh, training, the letters are basically being deleted from the screen, deleted from the computer screen according to the reading, uh, uh, the reading directions. So in English here, it's from left to right. Uh, please note that we use an updated version of this training method. So the letters are not just being deleted totally from the screen, but they are replaced with X's. So uh, we wanted to imitate how written materials are presented on the screen. And in real life, the letters are not just diminished from the screen. There's still something there at the beginning of the sentence. Um, this program has two modes, evaluation mode, when the individual's own reading paste um, the individual reads in his own reading pace, uh, click, uh, clicks a button when finishes reading and has a comprehension question just to verify that they actually read what was written on the screen. And then the time per letter in milliseconds is being evaluated. And then in the training phase, the letters are being deleted from the screen initially in the same uh, reading pace of the reader, but then it starts speeding up. Um, I will show you uh, some results of four weeks of training five times per week in children with uh, dyslexia and in typical readers, which takes us to the next part of the study. So what happens if we stimulate these parts of the attention network model? Uh, the results are from children that are eight to 12 years old. The IQ is average and above average. We determine dyslexia by having at least uh, two tests standardized tests uh, for word and non-word reading. We use the tower test that is timed um, and, uh, and tests and subtests from the GORT, which is a reading fluency and reading comprehension battery. And of course we diminished um, um, or did not include children with attention deficit. We tested them, uh, the children before uh, the training using both behavioral, um, behavioral subtests, uh, fMRI tasks, both resting state and reading tasks that I will show you in a second. We trained them for four weeks, five times per week, and we tested them again right after, uh, right after the training. What did we find? So behaviorally, we found that children with dyslexia uh, read faster. You see here the speed of millisecond per letter. So they read significantly faster following intervention. And the same was observed in typical readers. Uh, we know that typical readers can read faster. Um, Five minutes. Thank you. Uh, we also found an improvement in comprehension in individuals with dyslexia, which was absent in typical readers. And we do know uh, the typical readers, they all already started at, at, ceiling, at the ceiling. So we did not expect um, an effect on that um, in that measure. What about executive functions? So I I'm going to show you just two measures. We had we had plenty of measures that we collected, several subtests for executive functions. And just on, just based on the slide for the attention network model, you really realize that the big term executive functions is broken into many subcomponents. Uh, what you see here is a visual attention task from the teach battery and uh, um, the naming task that is related to uh, speed of processing, verbal speed of processing. We found an increased, um, increased uh, visual attention scores in individuals with dyslexia and also in typical readers and faster naming, uh, faster naming abilities in individuals with dyslexia that was not observed in typical readers. Uh, the neuroimaging data. So um, uh, what you see here is uh, the data for individuals with dyslexia before and after intervention during a lexical decision task. And you see here the contrast between words reading and non-words reading. And we decided to put a seed here in the fusiform gyrus because in past studies, we found that this type of intervention showed a greater engagement of the left fusiform gyrus in individuals with dyslexia. So we decided to look at this region as a seed and to see which other regions, which other regions of interest communicate with this 
uh, with this uh, a visual processing region in dyslexia following intervention. We found that before intervention, there was an increased functional connectivity with uh, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that is also related to working memory. And we assume that when individuals with dyslexia are reading, they are looking for the um, uh, semantic, uh, maybe semantic cues or in their lexicons trying to realize if they are familiar with this word or not. What we found after intervention is an increased functional connectivity with the anterior cingulate cortex for an area 24 that is also related to uh, error monitoring, to the error-related negativity that we found in previous studies using EEG. So following, uh, following training, there is a greater engagement of these two regions and also greater activation of the error-related negativity, which we found in previous studies. Looking Two minutes. Thank you. Looking specifically at the network that is related to the, uh, to the uh, error-related negativity and, um, um, and to error monitoring, we focused on the singular apericular network and the functional connectivity within this network during rest. So the participants were not doing anything. And we found that there is an increased functional connectivity within this network following training, as you see here. And this increased connectivity was also related to increased reading skills, word reading skills in these readers. When we try to see if there is a moderating effect of executive functions that are involved in this reading gain, uh, and here you see long-term reading gains, okay, so three months after training, um, specifically in reading fluency, we found that speed of processing that was measured using the WIS coding subtest and also inhibition moderated this increased um, behavioral reading gain. We're still not sure about the neurobiological correlates for it, and we are looking into it. So just to sum up, because uh, really the time is up, there are some things that we know and some that we really don't know, and it's still in work. Um, in word decoding and fluency, which we put lots of effort to define, uh, we see an, in, an increased engagement of the singular apericular network related to error monitoring together with visual processing regions, uh, increased singular apericular uh, uh, functional connectivity of a singular apericular network, increased error related negativity following training, and also an activation of the anterior cingulate cortex. A recent study by my uh, student, Nico Taran, showed also that during fluent reading, we see increased functional connections within the singular apericular network and between these two networks. Uh, and we're still working on looking at the other domains as well. Mechanistically, what do we think that is happening? And again, this is uh, my thought. I know that the time's up. So, um, just to tie everything together, we think that when the letters are being deleted and, and changed to access, visual attention uh, is involved, which is related to these networks here, ventral and dorsal attention. The individual cannot regress back or regress, for they can regress forward. They usually reduce the number of regressions back to the beginning of the sentence because there is nothing there. Uh, that works on inhibition that involves frontoparietal networks. And then more letters are being processed in a given moment in a faster speed. Here we have working memory and, and speed of processing that involve frontoparietal. And when faster information, when there's faster information reading and more, more, maybe more efficient switching between phonological and orthographical processors, then uh, we see a uh, singular apericular network uh, that is engaged. Again, this is uh, my take still work in progress. I would really like to better understand um, um, the processes behind this program. So to conclude, cognitive control or executive functions have an important role in reading in both typical and atypical reading development. Training may engage executive functions related networks during word and fluent reading. There is an increased synchronization between reading related networks, visual, language, and executive function neural circuits. The effect is not specific to reading tasks. Uh, we also see specific effect in an NBAC task that we're currently looking at, which is an executive function task and the involvement of attention network in this uh, simple view of reading model 
should be considered. Uh, and maybe we can look at sub profiles of individuals with different um, executive functions, cognitive abilities uh, to see the level of engagement of these networks in these um, components. So um, I will end here and ongoing studies, we may think that uh, training specifically these subcomponents of executive functions may make a difference uh, and maybe increase gain. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. I think we have four minutes for questions. Yes. Sipi, are you leading us? Sure. I see that you have a question, Nama. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, you were talking about inhibition and the relation between inhibition and uh, reading in dyslexia, and I was wondering if you could uh, say some more about uh, the effect of inhibition. You mentioned inhibition as a, to inhibit regression, but sometimes regression is, uh, is adv advantageous. So I wonder what you think about the connection between inhibition and reading. So um, um, I think that there are still still things that we don't know. Um, I do see from studies that involve eye tracking, for example, that inhibition uh, or inhibiting uh, individuals with reading difficulties to go backwards, uh, to regress, um, um, that actually helps them, uh, helps them with reading because they read faster. Whether they also read accurately, that's another question. As you said, maybe the inhibition also helps them to gather more information from the written material and to uh, comprehend the sentence even better. This part of the, of the model and, and of our suggestion, specifically in the slide that I showed, is still uh, understudied. So we collected both eye tracking and MRI data simultaneously to actually see whether these individuals do go backwards or do not go backwards and to try to realize which neural circuits are involved there. Um, but we still don't know. This is really still, still studied. Thanks. Any additional questions from, the, um, from our audience? Um, so maybe, oh, Tali. Well, this is not a question. I thought if, if we can <clears throat> just answer Esti's uh, question from before, mm -hmm. uh, relating uh, my, my findings and Nama's uh, suggestions. So I think they are uh, indeed uh, going together really nicely because I don't think there is a single route for, uh, for reading. So I think having multiple uh, uh, grain size units as uh, in connectionist models uh, suggest. So having a, a, a bigram or morpheme or several sizes of units being mapped from orthography to phonology and to semantics does make sense. Uh, of course, when we're taking, I mean, Nama's way of choosing uh, participants or selecting or testing participants in a very particular way is really useful in mapping exactly where in the process uh, the morphological deficit resides. Uh, we are taking them kind of as a whole group in order to, to afford, you know, the, the group power for, for fMRI and for and, and neural studies. But I do think they totally go together in terms of the of the findings. I mean, I don't think there is a single route for, for you know, reading whatever size of uh, units we're talking about. And having different morphology, different types of morphological deficit definitely, definitely makes sense. Uh, if I may also connect with Merav's talk, uh, I think it's a really nice uh, idea of uh, having a fast decay uh, in, in dyslexics, and this might also explain our findings of uh, uh, problems with extracting regularities, because if there is a fast decay, you, you cannot, uh, you know, you don't have the representations to, uh, to map between when you're learning. Uh, so I would really not, uh, like to see some of Merav's paradigms used in a consolidation type of uh, 
um, design, so testing the effect of longer time on, on this uh, decay. Um, this was my integrative thoughts for the session. Uh, and I also have some, some things to tippy, but there is no time I see. <laughs> I, I think, Tali, you're, you're uh, absolutely right. And thank you so much for making the connections because I also saw these, you know, um, um, I think that a commonality for, for most of the talks in this session uh, is that there is some underlying, maybe more basic difficulty in learning and consolidating information in individuals with, the, with reading difficulties. Um, I, I did want to kind of point at Nama's talk and see, you know, some some of the um, I think most of the of the stimuli that you presented um, were words, right? Uh, for for these uh, subtypes uh, of 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 individuals with reading difficulties, uh, I wonder if if the individuals were were seeing a missing single word within a sentence. Did they rely on the contextual information that is coming from the sentence in order to generate to generate the right word? Um, of course, yeah. Uh, we also show them uh, uh, sentences. The, the place where we see the most effect of uh, the sentential context is in cases where we have where a patient has a deficit in the phonological output lexicon or in the connection from the semantics to the phonological output lexicon. And in this case, what you see is uh, if you give them a sentence, Nufar is here with us. So I'll give an example from her work. So uh, a sentence like, uh, and reading matar, as matar or as matter, will, will be affected by, the, by being able to access semantics and will be affected by the way you uh, yeah, the way you re you read the previous words and semantics, and then you can select between the two representations in the phonological output lexicon. So we do have uh, these kinds of uh, tests, um, and uh, also a test called Schnitzel Bashel, because Schnitzel can also be Schnitzel, and Bashel could be also Bashel. In these cases, there are some types of uh, impairments that uh, cause inability to use context, and in other cases you do see that context helps. So if a sentence, uh, you know, con uh, tells you I have to, uh, I paid a lot of uh, bills, it will, they will not read it, they will read it as cheshbonot and not as cheshuvot. So it, again, depends on the profile, on the profile of this lexi. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, and also the, the special characteristics of Hebrew here help a lot to look at these sub sub uh, sub profiles of mm -hmm. of readers uh which was also seen in the other presentations uh, i know that we are just starting looking at uh hebrew uh, uh using a functional mri so it will be super interesting also to compare the results uh, from children uh looking at he looking reading hebrew versus those reading English versus adults reading Hebrew and English and the involvement of these mechanisms that all of you were talking about this session um, and the session in these subgroups of readers. Um, and I, Dror, you have a question? Uh, I think ah, he, said he was waving goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> um, if there are no extra questions, no additional questions here, I think uh, maybe we can be sensitive to the time um, for the poster session. Um, I would like to thank you for listening. Thank you for the, for the great talks that we had here today. It was a pleasure and an honor to chair this session. And hopefully to see you, as Nama said, next year, Eden uh, Khumust in Akko, all of us together in the same space. Bye, thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, Tipi, for organizing. Pleasure. Thank you. See you soon.